So for everybody coming in late, it's it's so much easier to tell if you're in the right room. Because when I came in here, this slide wasn't up. Um, so I couldn't tell. <laughs> like, I'm in the right spot. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So um, today we're going to talk, and it's going to be a discussion, not me talking, um, about Drupal 9 Components Library, uh, the next theme system. Um, those of you who don't know me, um, I'm John Alvin Wilkins. Uh, I'm a, currently a, a senior front end developer at Previous Next. Um, and I've been doing Drupal since Drupal 4.6, I think. I mean, I, 4.5 was like the latest release when I first looked at it, but I didn't actually start using it until 4.6 was out. Um, so I've been doing this for quite a while. And um, I. Uh, I gave a presentation in DrupalCon San Francisco right before um, Drupal 7 was released and, and showed the simplified view of the D7 theme system here. Um, it, it was fairly complicated, um, and uh, somebody asked a giant room full. Was it, was it Steve? Was it you who said who, do how many people, how many people here understand yeah this diagram and it was basically still just me <laughs> um oh no we're, wait were you, were you there when <laughs> yeah so if you've been there there been two people right with their hands up um we're not going to go over that really um this is a super super simplified version of the just the theme layer of uh drupal 7 and um and and yeah this still applies to drupal 8 as well um, basically, your, your data comes up from the database and all the other places, um, and then the modules are what's in charge of providing your markup. Um, JavaScript, um, CSS, they all come from the modules originally, and then the themes sort of override those bits as it passes through the system to end up in you know, the end user's browser. Um, and this, this was certainly a fine architecture when we came up with it. Um, but uh, nowadays, uh, there's really been a, a sort of revolution in the front end about we, we've sort of finally got our act together and like, hey, we can do architecture, right? Um, so this is much closer to what a modern front end um, architecture looks like, right? So the heart of it is the component library. So each of your little chunks of design are encapsulated with a, a chunk of HTML, a chunk of CSS, um, you know, optional uh, JavaScript as well, right? So the that thing, which is called a component, you know, has everything that you need in order to style and display um, this piece of the site, right? Um, so your component library becomes a collection of all these design elements that are then put together, right? Um, and you know, oftentimes you'll have various preprocessors, so you can convert SAS into CSS, um, you know, CoffeeScript into JavaScript, that sort of things. Um, but those those are all within your component library. Um, and because you have this system, you sort of need to have it all documented. So you'll often have a a style guide that's automatically generated from the component library that lives next to your component library. Like, hey, this is what's what's going on. Um, inside this component library, and then your application, which is Drupal in this case, right, is pulling those resources from the component library. It's got the data, and it goes, okay, I know that I want to have this thing styled in some way, right? Um, so I'm going to grab a component from the from the library and say, my data goes in here, and then send it off to the rest of the system, right? Um, so this, of course, is a lot different than what we currently have. Um, but the good news is that Drupal 8 has all the pieces we need. They are just in the wrong order. <laughs> um, and um, th this is the last slide, really. So if you look at this and start thinking about, OK, what do we have in Drupal 8? How can we rearrange these pieces so that they make sense and can fit into this model? Um, the theme registry. You know, where we have this collection of template files right now, that's effectively the component library. It's just not, it, it lives throughout all these different modules, and we need to take the theme registry and convert it into this is a component library, right? 
Um, and this is where all of our our, temp our individual components live in their their templates and their JS um, and their CSS, right? And if you look at an individual component, you realize that since it's a bundle of CSS and JavaScript and HTML, it, it maps really closely to what's considered a library uh, in Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Um, so again, like they're in the wrong order. They're also named wrong, right? So <laughs> we've got good things. We just need to like put them into this order so that it makes sense to people coming from other, other systems, right? And this is going to help us as well, right? Because it, it turns out that back-end developers, um, there's two problems, right? Uh, so because they're in charge of providing the markup in HTML, um, one, uh, they're not that good at it. They're, they're not good at writing HTML. Um, <laughs> and two, they're not really that interested in, in writing it uh, well. Um, I... Um, We've been doing this concept of development at Previous Next, and um, one of the developers there, uh, Cameron, um, he he texted me and he was like, "Man, John, I love the style guide stuff," because um, you know he's looking at the style guide to figure out how to get his his chunk his data to look like the things in the style guide, and all he has to do is go and look at the style guide and grab out some some classes and stick it into his markup, and poof, right, like it. He's, he's, so he said, I love this style guy stuff because I can make things pretty, <laughs> right? So if we give module developers a style guide of the Drupal system, um, they're going to be so happy. They're like, oh, man, okay, I just have to, like, use that component, and it's going to look like this. Like, they just sort of, like, put all these design pieces together, and it looks pretty, right, instead of, like, like ass, which is what it usually looks like, right? <laughs> um, so this is my my concept of of what Drupal nine should look like. And effectively, we have this component library, and the module developer says, "I've got this data. I want to hook it up with this particular component and send it on the way to this, the system." So I have a vague idea of what themes would be. They would basically just be ways that you would like rewire those connections um, and in that case like so you would get this this chunk of data with the like I want to be put into this component um, along with some context right so that you know what's going on and then based on that context you can rewire it to be a different component library and it would be a really simple switch usually you would just like oh instead of that component use this other component right um, now Drupal's going to come with a, a a much smaller set of components than it currently comes with uh, theme hooks because they're just kind of crazy on the theme hook side right now. Um, but it will be possible for uh, modules to, you know, register a new component to add to the library, right? So, like, if they go through the entire style guide and they're like, I can't find anything that I need, they can, you know, go and add something, right? So, the date module is not in core. Is it in D8? Yes? In and there's a date field, it's not the complete date suite. Right, but it's not like a, the pop-up widget of the, the date picker. It, but... Sure. But yeah, so that's a pretty specialized component is what I was trying to say. So like, maybe that's part of Core's component library. Maybe, it, maybe it's something that the date module registers into the component library. Right. Um, and... Uh, that's it. That's the big picture. And then I want to like have everybody discuss sort of the, the nitty gritty details of like how we how we could fit all these pieces together, um, because I just didn't want to overthink it before I got to meet the really smart people who can collectively overthink it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, what do people think? Yeah, okay. Get the microphone, please. Yes, okay. Uh, are there small things we can already do in Drupal 8 that would help transition? So, is it not on? I think it is on. Okay, really close. Okay, so are there things we can still do in Drupal 8, as in things that are named slightly awkwardly that would a rename would make it easier to transition to this world? Like, for example, libraries of the ML. That kind of makes sense. It's an asset library, 
but we didn't have him better if it was called components or assets or stuff like that. Are there such small things that would transition, make the transition easier? Well, I, I mean, I don't think I don't think there were things we can do in in Drupal eight in, in eight point one or eight point two that we could like. I don't think it's wise to try to make those changes during any part of the eights recycle. Okay. We're already we we're you know Morton and I and and all the themers are trying to simplify all the markup, but just converting it all into Twig was so much work already. We didn't we haven't been able to like shrink that code base of all the theme hooks, right? So um, simplifying the the theme hooks is going to be one of the first steps. So so renaming some other bits is just going to cause okay. inconsistency. I mean, it's already inconsistent, so it's fine if we just keep them named the same thing during 8.x, right? Um, but as we get to 9.x and we sort of need to, like, have an actual, like, plan of, like, okay, libraries get renamed to components or, you know, things like that. I have a list of things that, that need to be renamed so that they they match the uh, front-end architecture. Okay. Yeah. Hey, John. Uh, I, I think... Hey, Steve. I think, yes, <laughs> there are things that can be done in the eight cycle. Uh, I think the the simplest version that you're talking about is moving files we already have. So we already have uh, template files. We already have CSS files that I, I hope are broken up such that they line up with the template I, file, but maybe uh, not. Uh, but it, I, I think it's not I that I mean, they, they, should. Right. They, they, they should. We're trying to get them closer there, right. and we can continue to doing that during eight. Right. You're right. Right. So I, I think it wouldn't be uh, that radical to say, uh, instead of putting templates and CSS and JavaScript into separate directories per file type, we're going to move them into separate directories per component. I think that would not be that radical of a change. Right now, in hook theme, uh, you don't declare the CSS and JavaScript that's expected that has to get added onto the render array at runtime, which is different from render elements, which you can say this render element always needs this CSS and always needs this JavaScript. We could add that concept to hook theme, I think, without breaking backwards compatibility. I think that's a change that could happen in the eight cycle. Take out the places where libraries are added at runtime and move them into hook theme. That I think wouldn't be that big of a change. And it wouldn't break backwards compatibility. It wouldn't stop people from adding libraries at runtime. Just core adds them in hook theme to make it a little more easier to understand. Uh, long term, I, I do think we, we would need to do something that break backwards compatibility. Because I think this idea is most beneficial when each component can be named independent of its data structures. Right now, node is the data structure, node is the name the, of... There will be no node component. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was, how can you do that? Yeah. Uh, in the previous core conversation, I was, I was giving the presentation what panels can teach us about web components. And right now, panels can do that. It can have the layout plugin be named something completely separate from what's the, the source data object. And in panels layout plugins, you do this kind of declaration mm -hmm. of you say, this panels layout always needs the CSS. I don't know if it has a place for JavaScript, but you know, one more property to declare. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, just as an aside, so layouts are also just components. There is you know, a specialized kind of component, but they're mm -hmm. just like some wrapper divs um, right. and you know, placeholders for other data like that's that they're simple co components. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The the out of the box panels use cases like kind of global level layouts, but in implementation, I use them all the way down to view modes. Um, I've probably talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> Larry's up next. So. Yeah, uh, Steve, for for the thing you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. the ability to add uh, to attach assets mm -hmm. or attach asset libraries in uh, hook theme. Mm -hmm. um, Something like that actually is already in core, so not for hook right. theme, but uh, actually within the Twig template itself. So in, within a Twig template, you can now say attach underscore library, so the attach library function there, and then you can just say, okay, attach this library for this Twig template. But if it's then overridden, that Twig template, you have the choice to not add that asset library or add another one or do whatever. 
So I like does that fully answer that need? I, I have the sense that it does because it even then allows you to not have to deal with t PHP at all because mm -hmm. it's then completely in Twig. So just so mm -hmm. you know, and hopefully that is sufficient. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll say I I don't know. I don't know how much functionality we want to put into the Twig template. I think when we introduced Twig, the idea was let's make these templates as simple as possible. Let's make it so that they're not responsible for much. And as we found out all the things Twig can do, we're putting more and more responsibility back into those Twig files because we're learning all the things they can do. Should they? I don't know. What What is the thing that defines the component? Is the thing that defines the component the Twig file? And the Twig file says, uh, what its CSS is, or is the thing that defines the component uh, a class or an entry in a YAML file, and there it says, this is my template, this is my CSS file. Uh, so so I, I, I would like to point out, like, there's this technology, this future HTML technology called Web Components, which is basically templating system inside the HTML language itself. Um, Steve, I think you've heard of those before, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, which Steve just talked about. Um, I mean, like, in a session, like a whole session about it, so if you didn't see it, go watch the video. Right. Um, and, uh, I, I, like, I think we should try to, you know, look to the things that are, are obviously going to be, like, some sort of consensus, and I don't know how web components work enough. I haven't looked at the spec details enough to say how do they bundle up their CSS and their JavaScript into a web component, and we should try to follow that model. Yeah, th there, are, there are a couple ways, but one of the ways is to say that the web component is this .html file, and then from that .html file, you can either the CSS or JavaScript is inlined, or there are other ways of referencing. Um, so I, I think one of the goals here is making sure that our, our concepts line up with the concepts that are going to be used in modern front-end tools like web components, so that even if the specific technology changes, it's, it's harder to reprogram us than it is uh, to reprogram Drupal. Uh, the concepts we tell ourselves are much more deeply ingrained than the ones we code into Drupal. I'm going to change gears slightly here. <coughs> um, going component library sounds great. Components, yay. Um, but there's still the problem of what the pipeline is for rendering those. The reason we have the uh, giant cloud of er arrows that go everywhere to define our theme system is because we have not made up our mind whose job it is to pick which component gets used where. And if a component has any configuration or can vary, whose job is it to, uh, to decide that? We have not said no to any given workflow, which means that we say, well, you suck to every workflow. So if you want to go this route, I'll ask you, what workflows and what functionality are we willing to just say no to and not support in this approach? E.g., are we willing to say semantic views go away? You just don't work because the template should control that. The, the component itself should, com should control that. How much configuration do we want to allow in a one of these components? And Morton's coming up because he's going to disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what... What piece of our four overlapping theming concepts are we going to just jettison to make this possible? Because we can't not jettison some of them. Which ones do you want to jettison? Um, I have a feeling that maybe Morton has an answer to this particular <laughs> question, so I'm going to let him just go with that. So uh, we had this discussion in Munich um, that's three years ago. One of the questions was always, like, how do we want to control our markup? And, and the, we have asked this question out a lot of times. We did the survey last year. We have a very small group in the front end world who want to have configurationable fields and have to go in through a UI and click and do stuff and say this should be an H1 and add this class and do this class. The overall thing I've always been like, put it into template files. Um, and it's like 80, 90% who wants that. So I think we can, I would put my head on the, what's it called? Chopping block, yes, that was the name for it, uh, and say that, well, the the configuration put it into the template so we know where it's at. That's where front end usually work. 
You don't want to be able to like do the stuff two different places. Um, have it in the templates. That's what we're already just doing now with how you control all your classes. So a, a module like um, the semantic views is kind of not needed because semantic views got built because it was a clusterfuck to change these things. Had it been easy to do that directly in the template, the module had never been built. It was kind of tools where we was trying to fix all the symptoms. If, the, if, that, if that held up to figure out which things we're gonna chop off. I'm perfectly okay with that as long as we decide we're going to make a decision on some of these. If the decision I, is that direction, I'm, I'm cool with that. Yeah, I, I would also like to see um, a simplified flow. I mean, this, this is, this is WIM's excellent uh, Drupal 8 request handling and rendering flow, and it gets s way more detailed than I ever imagined was even possible, really. Um, and so I would definitely go check out his session if you want to check out the, the D8 pipeline, and he's popping up here to, to say something. Um, but um, I would be fine if we could simplify the number of places where you could do things. Um, I would say that, you know, the the module says, okay, here's my default, you know, data, or here's my data, and here's the default component I want to use, and like, doop. and then you know maybe other modules can come in and modify the data, I guess, because they still need to do that, and then like, the next step would be, then the themes get to decide whether they want to rewire it, and like, I don't see a whole lot of other things. We could simplify all those different ways that you can change things, pre-process, and you know all the things that we had just really simple clear steps of these are the you know couple places that we do and and also one of the things that i just hate about render arrays um is that it's it's self-modifying code right now so like depending on the things that you stick in the render array it will change the way it gets rendered and it has so it has all these different callbacks that modify each other that just drives me crazy it, because depending on when you access that render array, there are different things in the array because bits of it have self-modified it to add more children and more prefixes and the libraries can... Oh, if that can go away, I would be so happy. <laughs> yeah, so fortunately the render rendering flow, the diagram you have right there, is pretty much in completely independent of what we're talking about here. This is more high level, sure. determining what should be rendered and so on. But yeah, it's definitely related. It's, where is it? The the bit we're talking about, I guess, is just down yeah. here. So basically down in here, HTML maybe? renderer, yeah. yeah. And even that is just, it's mostly independent of what we're talking about here. But yes, that is the most relevant part of it. Um, but I wanted to talk, or, or reply a bit to what Larry and uh, Morton were saying. Uh, I totally agree that it should be much simpler and actually um, that strange interaction between render arrays, which are supposed to be the single source of truth, and then themes, as in Twig templates overriding things, like that those things always, like there's always friction and there's always confusion and problems and there's lots of bugs because of that that we had to find, had to do complex things for to actually work around. So yes, I would also love it that everything was just in a template and all the configuration would, would be going away. But I think there are actually different levels of configurability there. So for example, you were saying uh, that, I, that the title field maybe should have an H1 or an H2 or something else. Yes, that should be in the template. That shouldn't be configurable in the UI. But then there are other levels, such as if you have a node and that node has many fields, what is the order that the fields are rendered in? Like for site builders, you kind of want that to be configurable in the UI, but then that kind of conflicts with what you're saying, but not entirely. It would be much easier if we could get rid of that, and then everything would be the single source in the single source of truth in a template. But can we actually do that? Because I think part of the answer, or part of the question that we have to ask here is, how much power do we want to give to the site builder? Because that kind of conflicts with the front end person. people understand what I'm saying, contemplate what that is, and how evil contemplate was. <laughs> uh, so contemplate is basically able to edit your templates directly in the browser, um, which can be a really, really awesome thing. Um, can also be very dangerous. In, uh, with Twig, we, don't, we can't drop our own database. We can't do really dumb stuff. Um, so what if we said, well, you want to reorganize your stuff. We make it easy for you as a site builder to do that stuff instead inside of this file. 
so you have uh, um, so you could go that way instead. So you actually would just edit your template files and put your data that way. And I know that maybe it's going to destroy some of the site building idea if you just you know, mindless can click and move your stuff around. Um, but how much, how many, uh, like on, a fi on the field level, how many times are you actually moving that stuff around? Yeah. I mean, seriously. So, um, way back in DrupalCon Denver, perhaps, back in the, like, yay, we can do anything in Drupal 8 days, um, we, we had a conversation where, where we talked about, you know, if we get Twig in, Twig, I mean, those are Twig templates, but they, in the back, they get they get compiled to like PHP objects, which means that you could theoretically, you know, ins introspect them. I'm not a back end developer. You can introspect them, and then you would be able to, you know, to if you could look at it in the right way, you could have the the uh, content administrator's forms like lock out different things, saying like, well, this template has prevented you from doing this feature. I'm going to gray it out, right, that sort of thing. You're talking about a conversation in the bar at DrupalCon Munich. Okay, sure. Uh, I remember discussing that with uh, Sam Boyer oh, yes. and Chris yeah. Vanderwater, and I think you came by. Yes. Yeah. And it, it 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 basically came down to the idea of I was misremembering how tall the beard. Was. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, replacing the like the panels UI and stuff like that become uh, GUIs for editing Twig files that have extra annotations in them of some kind. Um, and then, you know, you, instead of saving a config object, you save a Twig template, and a Twig template has extra comments in it or whatever, so we can then, you know, modify that from the UI. But you can also just grab that Twig template, and Morton can have his way with it. Actually, do anything there is a then also bad camp a year and a half ago, one of the dreams that came up when we began to discuss these ways of working was the idea of building, um, what's it called, a Chrome extension. So, you know, a front end that works anyways uh, by sitting and viewing source so much. So what if you can actually have a Chrome extension, you could click directly and you can begin to modify stuff and send that back to to the site because we're using this contemplate idea. So we kind of, we kind of kill actually the site builder, which you know, I'm fine with. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but that's a, that's that would be a concept that we then need to figure out all all go both ways. But we say, well, if if this is if this is an element that the theme is over uh, have, have written over, how do we then modify that? We need and by the way, we need that module at some point. I'm not going to write it. Yeah, I, I'm going to super fast because I just say Morton was just up here and yes. I can see Kevin get in line here and and I. Um, I would like to point out that the style guide here, even though we haven't talked about it at all, it's going to be an essential part of, of Drupal 9 um, because it's, it's the guide that allows the developers to pick the component they want, right? You just look through the style guide. Oh, that's the thing I need for my data, right? Um, and, of course, it's going to make all the designers happy because you, they'll be able to implement their, you know, their design system as a component library, right? So themes can have their own... Um, their own component library. I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but like, that's why we're having this conversation, right? So uh, that's going to be is a really critical part. It's not just like, oh, you can also do this. It's going to be in core as well with the component library. Yeah, I just wanted to, I, I'm not going to make a new point or something. I just wanted to stress that we should not forget about the site builder aspect um, because maybe all of us here are front end people and then it's quite possible that we are fine with just getting rid of that whole experience, which could be an option, but like we have to actually consider which way we want to go there and just not forget about that aspect. That's all. Yeah. I, I, I think that, like I said, this, this rewiring bit where you like change, you decide I'm going to change what component for um, is being used for this particular piece of data, I think there's that a contrib module could come in and be like, okay, I'm going to make a GUI for this, right? And yeah. We wouldn't necessarily need it, as long as it would be possible, we wouldn't necessarily need to have that in core. I mean, maybe we would, but yeah. it seems like it could be done. Yeah. So the conversation, <clears throat> when I got up here, of course, have changed quite a bit. So let's see if I can figure out what I was going to say that might fit back into where we are right now. <clears throat> um, something interesting we're doing on redhat.com right now is we do have a component library. Um, and what we're looking to do is actually take this component library pretty much completely outside of Drupal. 
into a place where Drupal can access it, but you also our style guide can access it or WordPress or a Java app or something can access it. So it's actually like an external rendering engine that is doing a lot of these same kind of things. Um, so we have a bunch of templates, which we use in Swig, which is practically Twig on Node, um, where we're able to send data at it as just a big JSON format, and we turn markup back to it. And the nice thing with data is you can easily edit the data. So the whole site building portion of it is like, what order do the components go in? It just depends on the order of the components inside of that data structure. So you know, any of that editing, any of the, the the site builder themer kind of thing would be editing the data that gets eventually passed to the templating engine. So then once it gets to the templates, all the logic gets done there. The markup is then returned back to Drupal. And whether that's done inside of Drupal in that kind of method or if there's this external thing, um, the process is still kind of similar. So everything is data. Everything is just basically configuration of all these, of all these templates before it gets rendered and then sent back, sent back to the system. So that's the way we're approaching it. One of the things that we're doing to help that out is um, attaching schemas to every template. So we have a JSON schema that describes what all the template fields are, uh, the, the, the valid values for each one of them, the required fields, and those types of things. So any time that Drupal ingests a component, it can say, hey, this is all the stuff that's required for this. If I need to toss it into a node, it can automatically auto-populate that node with all the fields that are required for it and all the validation for it. So there's a really good conversation between this, this component, which is extremely non drupal -y, but can be ingested in and can be accessed through the API, uh, whether that's the Drupal or what's style guide or anything else you start throwing at it. So I know re really where that's going to go, if that's going to mesh with where Drupal's going, or if it's just an interesting way I, to look at the data. I think it would absolutely be way Drupal is going. And I think that it would, you know, we should make sure that when we're, you know, doing the actual coding for this stuff that we make it possible so that you know our, our component library is, is has sort of a, a light integration layer so that you could write a you know a new one so that you could just swap it out with like l let's say that web components the technology is not ready when Drupal 9 comes out so like when it is ready then you could write a, a wrapper that swap it out or you could write one that swapped in angular component library right and it just converts the PHP data into JSON and then sends it on to this rest of the system yeah. that's what I would like to see yeah, so you have that really clean separation of Drupal is pulling data together. It's basically creating the structure of what's on the page. But the whole rendering portion of it is a black box. And you can change anything that happens in the black box to the configuration, and you can set up what those configuration options are. Um, a nice thing for this is then you're able to use the same system regardless. It's an API, so Drupal can access it. Any site can access it. Your iOS app can access it. It's, it's not something that's locked into the Drupalisms of, of what we're using. And, and you know what, that now that I, you know, now that you brought that up, I think that might be a good way to sort of enforce the simplification of how our rendering goes because once you get to that integration level, you're basically like, okay, Drupal land objects, you are no longer allowed to touch this because it's going into, you know, the rendering layer or whatever, right? So you've configured it all and set it up and you're pointing it at the right components, but now you have to stop. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you get markup back. I mean, so this isn't purely headless. The markup still comes back to Drupal. You know, they can still cache it. They can still do what you need with that markup. But, um, yeah, the, there's a, a pure separation between those two. We're, we're kind of doing this uh, at the moment. We, we still have templates inside of Drupal. But all the devs are doing is just pulling the content down and basically plugging into this internal API, and it returns the markup. And, I mean, as you said, the devs love it because they don't want to fiddle with markup. They don't want to worry about what that return is. That's the point of the developer. Um, and then on top of that, we have the idea of pushing out releases of our back end. So if our back end, or sorry, our, our front end. So if the theming engine is completely separate, we can actually push out versions, um, uh, version, version, tagged versions of this. Uh, and so we're currently working on one version while the developers are implementing another, while another one is live, and we can continue to push versions out like that. So if you have multiple sites that are working off the same theming engine, one might be on 1.2, the other one might be a little bit older on like 1.1, and they can update to those new versions whenever they want to. It's, a, it's API, it's, it's semantically versioned, all those types of things. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I, I really want to see Drupal get to that point. And, and I think one of the key pieces you described in your architecture is that these components describe to some degree what they're expecting. And I think Drupal Core can get a lot better at that. A lot of our uh, theme hooks say, I expect element. And that's it. 
That's all that that's all that they tell the rest of Drupal because they're counting on this other pre-process layer to just figure it out for them. Uh, going forward, we need to get much more explicit about what does a theme hook expect because then we, we have the opportunity to swap it out. If, if all the theme hook says is I expect an element and all we can do is throw our hands up in the air and say, well, the pre-process is going to figure it out, but we can't expect a web component to be able to reproduce everything that's done in the pre-process. Now, if we knew explicitly all that theme item list expects is a title, the type of uh, UL or, or OL, and then a list of items. Like any, we could all rewrite theme item list in PHP. We could rewrite it in Twig. We could write it in pure JavaScript. That, that is a theme function that we at least have an opportunity to push off to a web component. Right now, pushing off theme node to a web component would be extremely difficult because so much happens in the preprocess layer that would be difficult to impossible to replicate um, in a web component. So we need, we need our components to describe what they expect and what they don't expect. And that also gives us an opportunity to avoid that breaking the UI problem. We're, we're talking about that as if it's a bad thing that we don't want to introduce, as if that's not happening all the time now. How, how many node.tpls have you overridden where you take that content variable and then you print exactly the field you want in exactly the place you want? By doing so, you're breaking the UI. That field is not going to drag and drop anymore. So yes, it's a problem, but it's not a, a new problem to avoid. It's a problem that's been around as long as I've been developing Drupal. I've been breaking the UI. Yeah. I've been breaking the UI since like CCK two or something. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. Exactly. So so yes, it's a problem, but it's not a new problem to avoid. It's a current problem that we can make incrementally better. So, um, I I think some people may have an answered this question a little bit already and you know I won't pretend that I totally understand you know e you know everything that's being said in terms of you know um, you know the, the underlying processes here but the conversation that I had with Sam Boyer to bring Sam Boyer back into in, in, <laughs> into the into the picture um, about uh, well it was in Prague at about two in the morning um, <clears throat> was was uh, exactly about this user problem that I that I sort of to him, which was, you know, okay, in the future, right, imagine if somebody could go to the front end of their, of their site and begin to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a site builder slash themer, um, do things to their site directly from the page that they're looking at to, to, to change those things. And essentially, um, you know, uh, Sam gave me a lengthy explanation, but what it, what it kind of boiled down to was that, you know, this introspection thing, that to allow people to change things from the front end in Drupal was like following the path of a, of a, of a, of a ball back through the pinball machine to where it started <laughs> to be able to figure out, um, you know, wh where that functionality or where that piece actually originated from. And uh, that, you know, it's not like, that Drupal's render array is not an MVC. It's not something that has a contract where you can clearly trace something back and say, oh, I can change this on the front end now because I can say, oh, that is connected to this, is connected to that. And I think some of the things that people have been saying you know, uh, before me suggest to me that maybe that this is becoming more possible, you know, that, we are, you know, that, we are, that we are getting to a point where you could, in fact, you know, and Morton sort of, I think, creeps towards this with like, I want to be able to go right through the UI, have a window through the UI into the, t into the Twig template, and then be able to change that and be able to see how that affects things. But I think that's kind of a, that's kind of a halfway there measure. Ultimately, we want to give people a, you know, the, a fluidity of being able to change their site and, 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 and do things with the immediate and direct feedback of, 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 of what they're doing on the front end of their site. And to do that, you have to have this thing that, that Sam talked about, this introspection, this contract where I can where I know, where everything is that is on the page is described in some way, that there's some kind of a manifest there that says this came from here, this came from there, that came from there. So if you want to rearrange this and redesign this, the pathways back to where the, the things originated is all there. And I don't know how much of that is there now in Drupal 8, but but I think that ultimately, for me, right, 
when I think of users and designers and developers and their experiences and themers, right, what we want to get to is a place where people can do that, right? We want to get to a place where people can have more direct and immediate control over the things that they actually see in front of them and the ability to man manipulate those things to get the, uh, the end result they want. Yeah. Um, and and uh, um, there's an example I can think of in, in Drupal right now that's similar to that. It's a horrible experience, but it, uh, <laughs> it's panels when you switch layouts. Right? So when you switch layouts, it, it tells you, okay, I'm effectively, I'm, you're going to move these, these chunks of data, which are regions, you know, from this one layout into this other layout. How do you want to map to, to this new, new layout, which has different arrangements of, of stuff? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree in that having the ability to do those mappings in the front end um, for end users is going to be really useful. I'm not as sure. I want to make sure that that's absolutely 100% possible, and whether it gets into core or not, it's I f we still it's it's tricky because like sometimes you architect things and you're like oh it'll, it'll be possible and then you find out when you go to do it that it's not possible right because of whatever bug or thing that you've done so there's a there's a little bit of feedback loop whereas if you say we have to have this feature in then at least you're sort of checking yourself as you build the architecture so I think I think that I think the um, the central point is you know, is it's great to have components and um, it's great to have style guides and it's great to have, and, and those things map to design systems, you know, and that's, a, and that's a very sort of, and it's a very sort of bottom up way of thinking about, about design and, and structure. And, I'm, and when I say design, I mean design, you know, with a, with a big D, you know, the, the design of all things. Design is how, you know, Job said, design is how it works. Right, it's it's the it's the architecture, the way that the way that this thing is structured, and 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 the components and everything like that is is is, is that that's the bottom up. But we need to sort of build from the bottom up with this view of a of, of an ideal future state of top down. You know, where where my front end has enough has enough knowledge of itself, right, and mm -hmm. where it all came from and how it was all constructed. So that if I wanted to make a contrib solution where a user could literally start dragging, dropping, and moving stuff around and say, okay, now save that as my new theme, that they could do that. You know, I mean, that, that, that's a tall order, you know. But, but I think if we, if we just, at this point, don't think about that functionality, but just think about, are we doing that? Are we are we are we are we creating this sort of like, you know, description of the page? This this, you know, this this thing that sort of describes the entire render page, rendered page, and where it all came from. So that if we want to if we want to go back in from the front end and do things to it, we can do that. Does yeah, that make I, sense? I agree. I yeah, it does make sense, right? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's why I tried to start with like the a high level idea and then get into the nitty gritty. But you need to make sure that we're exactly what Kevin just said. Always making sure that we're keeping that in mind because otherwise we can go astray by getting into the nitty gritty of our technology. Kevin, thank you. There's an excellent segue to the point <laughs> I wanted to make. Um, in order to do that, we've touched on this in a few places. There's two very important things we need to leverage: strong typing and coarseness. We're talking about you know, whoever it was that was from Red Hat uh, was talking about, you know, a component or a template or whatever that can describe what it is it needs. That's called strong typing. That's exactly the point of strong typing is clearly defined, this is the data type I need in this place. And that can be checked at the language level. That if it's checked at the language level, it can also be introspected by the code, and then we can build UIs off of that metadata that's baked into the language. So step one is using very strong typing. If you have a variable that doesn't have a type, you are robbing yourself of the ability to verify and automate your code. PHP traditionally has been a loosely typed language, so we can't do that. It is getting stronger all the time. Um, by the time we're in Drupal 9, we'll be in PHP 7, which can do e strong typing even on primitives. We should be doing that. Um, and by strong typing, I do not mean the type data API in, in Drupal 7, please, or in Drupal 8. Please do not confuse that with actual typing. Uh, it's, no. The other is coarseness. 
Um, this is not a new conversation. If you go back about three years, JC and Luizzi had an excellent blog post on um, design components in Drupal. And one of the points she made is we need to be a lot coarser with what these objects are, which means if we embrace this fully, theme item list ceases to exist because that is too fine-grained a thing to be thinking about. <laughs> okay. Steve's going to disagree with me any moment now. Um, no, DPA will go away because it's way too specific. It okay. can be a lot more generic. Um, but the like part of the problem that Kevin was talking about, you know, how do I know where this is coming from? And Sam was talking about the the uh, following the ball back. It's because our theme system and render system are too deep. We just get too fine grained in where we're capturing things, which means it's intractable to work your way back through the system because there's too many layers. If we want to do this properly, we need to have fewer layers at a coarser level, um, and those need to be strongly typed in terms of what they need, down to if it's you know, a node of a certain type, if it's um, a structure like this, like a, a view model object of some kind, that needs to be strongly typed, because that information lets us, that information that reduced uh, scope reduce the number of variables from a, a coarser grain uh, breakdown for our components, lets us it, build that kind of fancy introspective UI. It brings the, it gives us the metadata, metadata we need and gives it to us at a, a size, a chunk size that we can manage and that we could actually build a reasonable UI on top of if someone was so inclined. Currently, you, know, you could not build a, a UI for a render API that could do that. You need something that's much more strongly typed and much more coarsely grained to be able to pull it off. There's plenty of other benefits besides the UI to stronger typing and coarser grained uh, display, which you can get into another time, but that is the direction we need to be moving. Larry, it sounds like you're quoting my presentation, where I, I had the, uh, the slide that looked at traditional uh, Drupal core theming where each theme hook is of equal importance, and you have a comment inside of a comment wrapper, inside a node, inside the page, fields inside the node, inside the page, all of equal importance. I think this is the problem you're talking about. And, and that's true. Even within a field, you're probably calling multiple theme hooks inside of one field. It's overwhelming. One of the reasons I like panels is because I can draw those coarse boxes and say I care about the overall page layout, I care about each view mode, I care about individual blocks, and within that, I care differently. I care very strongly about calling each view mode its own design component, and Every one corresponds to a layout plugin. And my directory of layout plugins is basically my component library. Those layouts in Drupal 7 and Drupal 6 can allow you to think this way. It's painful. It requires a lot of experience with panels module, but it can be done. Uh, yeah, otherwise, you're, you're stuck tracing the pinball. The, the slide I've, I've got is Plinko from The Price is Right, where you look where did the Plinko slider, Plinko slider end and try and follow its path back up. And it's so frustrating. Um, the first site I make in Drupal 8, if panels isn't ready, the layer that I'm going to work at is hook template suggestion. I think that's what it's called. Where we, we now have a centralized place where we can more cleanly say, something we could say previously in preprocess functions, core, I know you're asking for a uh, theme node, or uh, I know you're asking to theme uh, an article teaser. In this one hook, I'm going to replace that with my design component illustrated list item. I, I think that's a workable starting point to say a given page is going to call 100 theme hooks, but these 10 are the ones we care about most, and we can, and we can replace uh, node hyphen hyphen article dot tpl with either illustrated list item dot twig sorry dot twig uh, or anything else and now uh, Larry and Wimmer are going to tell me why that's a bad idea <laughs> <laughs> actually I'm just going to suggest Steve at some point you and I should do back to back presentations that consist of nothing but us quoting each other because we seem to do that anyway <laughs> so uh, I, I agree that um the ability to say which things in a certain template, uh, what kind of data that can be, that that is super important, and that that is the only way we can 
sort of decouple because this is also about decoupling, right? You get data and you have templates and you have to figure out a way of how to make them interconnect and where to get data from. Um, coarseness is also very interesting, I think, but then new questions arise if you combine those two because if you're going to be coarse, um, are you going to be coarse in a way that is describing what it's going to look like or what it is semantically? But even disregarding that aspect, let's assume that w either of the two makes most sense, uh, is clearly better than the other, then we still have the, the problem that you need to be able to specify, okay, this coarse template accepts these kinds of things, these, this kind of data. But then your coarse thing is actually starting to be tied quite closely with things that aren't coarse, that are very specific things. And I think that is going to be very interesting and challenging because then you have coarse templates that are tied first maybe to relatively coarse things, very broad types. So for example, just, hey, I accept a string in this particular bit, but then maybe another part is saying I need a no type, which is a special type of string. And so start imagining that you have an entire style guide with many components and there is going to be nesting within those. And then within those nestings, within each of those templates which are already nested, you are going to specify this is the kind of data I want. And then there is another team that it may be going to override a, a default component from the, from the base team. And that maybe is going to then have more specific or maybe even less specific requirements in what kinds of data it accepts. And I think we shouldn't forget about that either because hook theme may be ugly, I agree. Um, but it's lack of typing also means that that's another problem you don't have. It causes other problems, but let's not forget that specifying that typing information is not without complexity and trickiness in how to combine things either. And I'm hopeful that we can find a good way, but it is not going to be easy. It very much reminds me of uh, semantic web stuff where we were supposedly defining ontologies, very broad things and within that more specific things. And that is taken off, has taken off in some regards, but not in others. And this feels very closely related to that because what we're basically building then is a relatively complex taxonomy of things and how they all fit together. And that's what we need in order to connect all the dots. But it's not going to be easy, I think. Hopefully somebody has good solutions for that, but it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I I want to look at like the web component spec and see like because I have a feeling that all those little bits can are they are they more complex than like this is a string I need these five strings to put into my template like I, I think that's still evolving. Um, in, in my research for the web component presentation I did, I looked at Polymer's documentation a lot and I couldn't always tell which thing was a Polymer thing and which thing was web components. There, there definitely are emerging standards for how do web components say what they expect. Um, they, they can expose public properties saying I expect a title, I expect um, a date, things like that. Um, is it good enough? I, I don't know yet, but it, it certainly reminds me of the dependency injection container. The idea that on the server side we can say this this class needs this service and all it knows about the service is that the service matches the interface. It's counting on uh, being able to call these methods. How it does that doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, I think we need a similar concept on the front end, the ability to say uh, we're rendering a node and we know to do that we need something compatible with this interface, either an actual interface or at least the concept of, of an interface. Um, and we'll see how that gets implemented specifically in, in web, web components and if we can line up with those concepts so that we're positioned well for web components but not marrying ourselves to web components before they are ready. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I agree. finally stopped lining up. There are like two minutes left in the session, so I think now is a good time to say thank you for coming because otherwise this session would have totally sucked. <laughs>